almost like it's surreal, like it's something you'd see on TV and that it couldn't be someone in our company, someone that we knew. She was very, very professional, um, bright, shining smile, um, very energetic. They say once a cheater, always a cheater. But what about a killer? Can someone who's taken a life do it again? Sadly, in this case, the answer is yes. Gregory Green, a man from Michigan, murdered his wife and unborn child in 1991 in a brutal attack. He stabbed her in the face and chest, then calmly dialed 911 to confess. After serving nearly 16 years, he walked free and with the help of his loved ones, including a pastor who would later regret fighting for his release because Green ended up marrying the pastor's daughter. But what came next was even more devastating. Green would go on to assault his new wife and murder his two children from a previous relationship as well as their two daughters together. How could a man responsible for such horror be given a second chance, only to destroy more lives? What went wrong? This is a case you won't forget, and it often flies under the radar. It's not widely known, and we're not romanticizing it here. We just want to raise awareness about the red flags that everyone should be on the lookout for. So let's dive in and uncover the true story. Now to start with, let's get to know the man himself. While there isn't a ton of information about Gregory Green's early life, we do know he was born in 1966. He came from what appeared to be a loving family, with a caring mother and a devoted father. He even had a sister, and it seems the whole family was actively involved in their church community. Unfortunately, details about his childhood remain a mystery. There's little information about whether he faced bullying or struggled with any substance abuse. It's a frustrating gap in the story, especially since understanding his background could shed light on his later actions. And as we move forward, we find Gregory in his late 20s when he crossed paths with Tanya, who would eventually become his wife, Tanya Green. She already had two kids from a previous relationship and soon she discovered she was pregnant with Gregory's child in 1990. Unfortunately, not much is known about the dynamics of their relationship, whether it was filled with love or overshadowed by tension. However, Things took a dark turn in July 1991. Tanya had confided in her best friend, someone she had known since middle school, expressing her concerns about Gregory. She revealed that he had been acting strangely and seemed to be involved with substances. Tanya made it clear that she was planning to leave him, saying, He's getting violent and irritable. I need to get out of here. And she had a plan. Attend church that Sunday morning, pack a bag afterwards, and finally break free from the troubled relationship. But tragically, that day never came. At 1.30 a.m. on that fateful Sunday, Gregory picked up the phone and dialed 911. I just killed my pregnant wife, he said, his voice unnervingly calm. I stabbed her and she's dead. She's lying in the kitchen. While the dispatcher fired off questions, Gregory chose to sit on the porch and wait for the police to arrive. When the officers got there, they wasted no time in arresting him. Inside the house, they stumbled upon a horrific scene. Tanya's lifeless body sprawled on the kitchen floor. She had been brutally stabbed ten times with a steak knife in the face and chest, and tragically, her unborn child was lost as well. By the way, I post true crime and new cases here every day, so if that sounds like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing. It helps a lot. Now, according to public records and reports, Tanya had two children, but only one was home during the horrific incident. The other child managed to hide in the closet, likely listening in terror as their mother's life was being taken. After the brutal act, Gregory was arrested and brought to trial, facing charges of second-degree murder. During the proceedings, he began telling his public defender that he was mentally ill and wanted to plead insanity. However, after a mental evaluation, the court decided against the insanity plea. In the end, Gregory was sentenced to 15 to 20 years in prison, a sentence that many felt was shockingly lenient for taking the lives of his pregnant wife and unborn child. Throughout this ordeal, Gregory's family stood firm behind him. This is where things get a bit murky because we don't know exactly what Gregory told his family about why he committed such a horrific act. Surely he must have said something to them. Maybe he claimed he blacked out or that he lost control. However, the specifics remain elusive. What we do know is that despite the gravity of his actions, he received a sentence of only 15 to 20 years. Starting in 2004, 
Gregory began seeking parole, but he was denied four times. The parole board cited his lack of remorse and inability to comprehend the severity of his crime. At one point, he was still placing blame on Tanya, claiming she was partly responsible for what happened. The board ultimately deemed him a danger to society, which is their primary focus when considering someone for release. During all of this, Gregory's family was advocating hard for him. His parents, his pastor, and his sister were all rallying behind him. They began writing letters in support of his parole. In 2006, Gregory's mother sent a letter to the parole board expressing her belief that he was genuinely sorry for what he did and had gained insight into his behaviors during his time in prison. While it's clear that a mother's love is powerful, it raises eyebrows to think it took 15 years for Gregory to have his insight. His sister also reached out to the parole board stating that over the years, Gregory had become closer to the Lord and read the Bible daily. She believed this spiritual growth was helping him through his challenging time. Fred Harris, the pastor we mentioned earlier, was more than just a man of the cloth. He was also a civil rights activist deeply involved in prison ministry. He knew Gregory and his family well, and he felt a strong calling to help Gregory turn his life around. Fred passionately fought for Gregory's release, believing that with support and faith, he could become a testament to the power of redemption. He even wrote numerous letters to the judge advocating for Gregory's second chance. According to the pastor, Gregory and him shared a friendship that extended beyond mere acquaintanceship before his life spiraled into chaos. Fred wrote to the Michigan Parole Board in August of 2005, highlighting Gregory's connection to their church community. In his heartfelt letter, Fred reflected on Gregory's past struggles, stating, he has paid for his unfortunate lack of self-control and the damage he has caused as much as possible and is sorry. Fred expressed hope that if Gregory were released, he would be welcomed back into the church and that the community would support him as he adjusted to life outside of prison. This support network was essential for Gregory, as it was clear that everyone was rooting for him to get a second chance. During his time in prison, Gregory made the most of his situation. He took various educational courses and engaged in mental health programs, showing a commitment to bettering himself. By 2008, he was ready for his fifth appearance before the parole board, a pivotal moment that would determine his future. As Gregory faced the board, three members sat before him armed with letters of support and records of his behavior during his incarceration. It was a tense moment, but all indications pointed to a favorable outcome. The board reviewed Gregory's time in prison and found that he had maintained a clean record since his altercation over the television back in 2002. The staff and correction officers spoke highly of him, noting his respectful demeanor and ability to get along with others. When asked about his plans for re-entry into society, Gregory's parents confidently assured the board that he would return home and that he already had a job lined up along with a supportive church community eager to help him reintegrate. With two of the three parole board members voting in favor of his release, the decision was sealed. In 2008, Gregory was released from prison, marking the start of a new chapter in his life. At first, things seemed to be looking up for Gregory. He secured a job and moved back in with his family. He attended church regularly and appeared to be turning his life around. Shockingly, just two years later, he completed his parole, an outcome that surprised many given the nature of his past. But life had another twist in store for Gregory. As he was trying to adjust back to life outside of prison, he unexpectedly grew close to Faith Green, the pastor's daughter. Their relationship turned into a sweet love story that almost felt like a fairy tale, a man with a troubled past finding comfort in the arms of a woman from such a different background. It was such a big change for Gregory, and it caught the attention of everyone around them, including Faith. But the thing is, she never really understood why he had been in prison at that time. Whenever she tried to ask him about it, he would change the subject or just stay quiet. This made her uneasy, and she couldn't help but wonder what secrets he was keeping. Now, Faith and Gregory had been living together as a blended family since their marriage on December 18, 2010. At first, everything seemed perfect. They were a happy family, attending church together and enjoying life with Faith's two teenage children, Chadney and Kara, and their two little girls, Coy and Kaylee. However, as time went on, Faith began to notice some troubling changes in Gregory. By 2013, he started showing signs of anger and aggression. 
There was one frightening incident where he kicked the couch while the baby was lying on it, which terrified Faith. He threatened her, saying she better leave or she would regret it. Despite her fear, she felt trapped, especially with her children in the house. Faith tried to seek help by applying for a protective order, but it was denied. She didn't mention Gregory's dark past, which was a huge mistake. Eventually, she found herself back with him, thinking things would improve, but the situation only grew more dangerous. Fast forward to August of 2016, and Faith decided to file for divorce again, feeling she had to escape the toxic situation. This divorce really made him angry, and it might have triggered something in him. Just a month later, on September 22nd, everything changed. Gregory lured Faith down to the basement. He zip-tied her hands and feet, then shot her in the foot so she couldn't move. It was a brutal attack. He went even further, slashing her face and body with a box cutter, leaving her in a state of panic and pain. But the whore didn't stop there. Gregory had rigged the family car to fill with exhaust fumes, trapping their two youngest daughters, Coy and Kaylee, inside. They died from carbon monoxide poisoning, a tragic loss that no family should ever endure. In a chilling act, Gregory then took Faith's two teenage children down to the basement, where their mother lay helpless. He shot both Chadney and Kara execution-style right in front of Faith. Can you imagine being a mother and having to witness such unimaginable horror? It's a heartbreaking tragedy. After committing these horrific acts, Gregory called 911, calmly confessing, Hey, I just killed my family. He sat on the porch and waited for the police again. When the cops showed up, they rushed right in and put Gregory in handcuffs. He didn't say much, but what they found was horrifying. The officers described it as one of the most gruesome sights they'd ever encountered. They discovered the body of the two little girls in the car, Coy and Keeley, who had tragically died from carbon monoxide poisoning. Then, they headed down to the basement where they found Chadney and Kara, the two teenagers brutally killed. Faith was the only one who survived, and they quickly rushed her to the hospital, where she spent a long time in intensive care. It's hard to wrap your head around the fact that this man killed his family not once, but twice. In court, things took a bizarre turn. When it was his turn to speak, he pleaded guilty. According to his public defender, he just wanted to get it over with. The pastor who once advocated for him to get out of prison, the one who married him, ended up facing the shocking reality of losing his four grandkids to a man he thought had changed. According to Faith, she had lost her memory of that fateful night, but it was reported that Gregory killed and shot her two children right in front of her. The horror of that moment was imprinted on the minds of those who heard the chilling details. Meanwhile, their younger sisters, Kaylee Green and Coy, met a similar tragic fate. The police reported that the girls were found dead in their beds, victims of asphyxiation caused by carbon monoxide fumes from a car parked outside their home. In a horrific act, their father, Gregory Green, had manipulated a tailpipe of the vehicle, directing the lethal exhaust fumes into the car, ultimately taking the lives of his own children. After committing this unspeakable act, he placed the young girls back in their beds on the ground floor of the house as if trying to mask the horror he had just inflicted. The car where Kaylee and Coy were asphyxiated had a hose connected to the exhaust snaking its way into the vehicle, creating a deadly trap that the unsuspecting children never had a chance to escape. When police arrived, they administered CPR, desperately trying to revive the girls before rushing them to the hospital. Tragically, their efforts were in vain. The children did not survive. Faith showed up at some of the court proceedings in a wheelchair, struggling to move after being shot in the foot. I'm not happy. I'm not satisfied with the outcome. There's no punishment that fits the crime. Not even torture and death would be justice. Your justice will come when you burn in hell for all eternity, for murdering four innocent children, all because you're insecure as a man. Plus the other two lives you took. You are a con artist. You are a monster. You are a devil in disguise. You are now forever exposed. It's hard to think that the children were brought into this mess, and they were only kids. Chadney was just 19 years old, and Kara was 17. Meanwhile, his biological daughters, Coy and Kaylee, were only five and four. Chadney Allen Sr., the father of the two teens, was heartbroken when he heard the news. 
He couldn't shake the feeling that his ex-wife might have known about Gregory's dark past, especially since he hadn't been aware of it himself. I didn't know any of that, and I'm, I'm surprised. I'm so shocked. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, did she know about it? You know, how could she not know about it and be involved with someone like that? She had two kids with the guy. During the funeral held for the four children, a pastor tried to comfort Chadney, reassuring him that none of this was his fault. Despite that, he was overwhelmed with guilt, feeling as though he should have stepped in sooner to protect his kids. You did nothing wrong! Look at me! You did nothing wrong! Nothing wrong! Nothing wrong! Nothing wrong! In a statement from the Waynes County Prosecutor's Office, it was announced that Gregory Green was sentenced to a staggering 45 to 100 years in prison. On top of that, he received an extra two years for a felony firearm charge. This meant that he will first serve the two-year sentence for the firearm offense. After that, he faces a lengthy 45-year term for the other crimes. If he serves his full sentence, he won't be eligible for parole until he is 97 years old. This sentence serves as a reminder that while justice cannot bring back the precious lives he took, it seeks to hold him accountable for his horrific actions. Therefore, sir, as to the charge of murder in the second degree regarding Kaylee Green, how do you wish to plead? Uh, as to the charge of murder in the second degree as to Coy Green, how do you wish to plead? Guilty, sir. As to the charge of murder in the second degree as to Kara Allen, how do you wish to plead? Guilty. As to murder in the second degree as to Chadri Allen, how do you wish to plead? Guilty. As to the charge of torture, in count five, sir, how do you wish to plead? Guilty. As to the charge of assault with intent to do great bodily harm, less than the crime of murder, as to Faith Green, and, 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 sir, how do you wish to plead to that? Guilty. Uh, it's a, my understanding that the defendant is prepared to accept the settlement offer of the people today, whereby he will tender a plea of guilty to the following charges. Count one, murder in the second degree of Kaylee Green, Count two, murder in the second degree of Coy Green. Count three, murder in the second degree of Kara Allen. Count four, murder in the second degree of Chaggy Allen. Count five, torture. Count six, assault with intent to do great bodily harm less than murder. Count 10, felony firearm. Now, six years after that tragic night, Faith Green made the courageous decision to share her story by writing a book about her harrowing experience. Her book titled, the monster that killed his family twice, the Faith Green story, was made available on Amazon in 2022. This gripping 118-page book takes readers through the horrific night where Gregory murdered her four children. It sheds light on an unimaginable pain Faith endured and offers a glimpse into the chaos of that fateful evening. In addition to her book, Gregory was also featured in the ID Channel docuseries Evil Lives Here, which aired in July of that same year. The episode, titled A Special Place in Hell, can be streamed on Discovery+. Plus. Interestingly, Faith expresses her hope that by sharing her experiences, she can help other women who find themselves trapped in abusive and dangerous relationships. However, not everyone fully supported Faith Green after the tragedy. While victim blaming is never justified, some people online and even in prison harshly criticized her for her choices. Would you say that there were red flags that you ignored? And if so, what were some of those? Um, I can say the red flags were, um, you know, mood swings, the arguments for no reason, or, you know, basically it was like being married, but single. He just, he just paid the bills, but he didn't want to be interactive. And, and, and then it got to the point where um, it was like, you know, he didn't want the older two there, really. Many pointed out that she knew Gregory Green was a convicted killer, yet she still chose to marry him. Although she initially claimed she wasn't fully aware of the extent of his crime, that didn't stop the wave of judgment from those who believed she ignored clear warning signs. The harsh reality is that Gregory's violent past should have raised more red flags. He had been convicted of killing his previous wife and their unborn child, an act so horrifying that it should have been a warning of what he was capable of. In the eyes of critics, that alone should have been enough for Faith to walk away before the relationship escalated. But relationships, especially those involving manipulative partners, 
are rarely so simple. Gregory, like many abusers, likely masked his true nature, presenting himself as someone who had changed. Unfortunately, the danger signs were missed and tragedy struck when he took the lives of their four children and attempted to kill Faith as well. The lesson people took from this tragic story is that past actions, particularly violent ones, can be an indication of future behavior. If someone has harmed others in the past, it's crucial not to ignore it. For many, Gregory's first murder should have been the undeniable warning, and ignoring it came at an unimaginable cost. This serves as a reminder for those to take any sign of violence seriously, no matter how much someone claims to have changed. But if you were the mother of two, would you take the chance to marry a convicted killer in the first place? We'd love to know your thoughts in the comments section. If you like the way we create these videos and want to help bring more cases like this to light, hit that like button and subscribe for more deep dives. Thank you once again for watching.